this is the drawing that we were allocated in this alternative histories project. Um, a pencil drawing made by Zaha Hadid. It looks like a study of a building that's going to be up against a retaining wall on one side. Maybe it's an end of terrace condition. It's a drawing we hadn't seen before, but probably felt familiar with the with the content or with the with the ideas that were in the drawing. Um, I remember Zaha very well from a time I lived in London when we would have been hanging out around the AA when she was still a student there. And then when I began to teach with Alvin Bayarsky, who, who you see on the left when he invited me to be an external examiner at the AA, um, Zaha's work was often on show and often under discussion. She memorably entered the Taoiseach's House competition here in Dublin in 1978, when a whole raft of London-based architects entered that competition. In fact, it was won by a London-based architect, but the project never went ahead. So 1985, around the time that Zaha would have made this drawing, um, this is a fantastic portrait photograph of her made in her office with the furniture that she had designed with the setting in which she chose to be um, represented and um, how very different it is from our office life. But around this time, she came to Dublin to do a lecture at the National Gallery, a lecture I remember very well, when she showed her winning project for the peak competition that was to be built in Hong Kong when she showed the kind of projects that you've just seen that she did for the Taoiseach's house in Dublin, when she was on the rise as a strong and original voice in contemporary architectural practice. And somebody asked her at that, at that uh, lecture, at the end of the lecture, with all her floating forms and with all her dynamic uh, gravity-defying presentation, if she had expectations that she would like or even prefer to wish to practice and to build in outer space. And Zaha was absolutely dismissive of this. And she said, I, I want to build right down here on the ground. And uh, don't you know, architecture begins with a plan. So it's not that we have so much in common with her or even that we know her so well. Um, we have the honor of um, having our names side by side on the wall at the RIBA. Um, but I was thinking about this, how do you work or continue to work on something that's made by another? Um, and I was reading Margaret Atwood's book, Negotiating with the Dead, which puts forward the proposition that no writer is ever truly alone. Everybody, all, all authors, are in um, collaboration of some kind, what she calls negotiation with the dead. I mean, I know in other disciplines, it is said that any work of art is always the result of the collaboration of at least two authors, at least one of whom is dead. So we do have some characteristics in common, I would say, with Zaha Hadid. I mean, this is our building most recently completed in Cork, where circulation is emphasized, where the materials of concrete and is, are strongly expressed, the raw material of the building, where the structure and services are strongly uh, zoned or um, categorized, um, where spaces are overlapping. I mean, I am well aware that our our work is entirely different, you might say, to the work that would ever have been done by Zaha. But there are some aspects of, um, let's call it negotiation, or some aspects of overlap that it might be interesting or might be untrue not to point out. Um, and then when you begin to make any piece of work, even if it is to be a continuation 
of work by another, you have to find a way that this new work becomes part of your own work. In other words, enters into the family or enters into the body, enters into the kind of um, accumulated body of your own architectural practice. And our practice is a studio-based practice. We work in conversation, we work uh, with consultants, we work with team members, we work with our fellow architects in a kind of toing and froing um, iteration between sketches made and ideas made possible. And just in this year, that studio life has been changed by the, by the lockdown. And so we find ourselves isolated from each other, um, driven out from our workplaces. And indeed, while we're out of our office, we use that, you know, once in a lifetime chance to upgrade and redecorate and clean out the space so that it's fresh for our return. Um, but this puts you in a different position, an, an isolated position, the position of working from home with very few tools around you and with all of your colleagues only accessible um, by Zoom or by um, in communications of this kind. So I started to sit down um, to cheer myself up with the, with the, at this desk that you see in the photograph where I'm working on the, on the stairs landing of our house. Um, small space, but at least it has a view and having coffee in the garden from time to time. So when the Drawing Matter Archive allocated us this drawing of Zaha's to make what I was thinking was Zaha alternative drawing, alternative design for Zaha, um, I started to draw over it and draw onto it in the way that I always work, by overlay, by um, kind of meditative, um, slow process of thinking by drawing. And I noticed as I stood up to go downstairs for one of those coffee breaks, that the very edge of, of my drawing table, you know, the little desk I have at the top of the stairs that you would have seen in that, that you would have seen in that last slide. Um, it has the alignment, it has the same alignment as some of the shapes in, in her drawing. So at a certain point, I wasn't sure if I was drawing from the plan of Zaha's sketch or if I was drawing from the shape of my own table. And I asked Sheila to take a look at it while I was drawing it. She's working downstairs um, in her uh, hidey hole. And Sheila made this lovely little quick sketch in watercolor to try to imagine a kind of more solid version of whatever it was that um, Zaha might have been picturing but reducing it down to fewer elements. And of course, that makes you think about lifting the building up above your head in the way that we did 20 years ago at the Glocksman Gallery, where you feel you're underneath the volume and you can enter that volume from below so that you kind of are drawn upwards and inwards by the hovering um, space above you. So I began to think about the volume being above and about um, access from below. And you can see in these kind of overlay working drawings that there's an idea about climbing up from underneath. And here I'm just reminding myself that of what Zaha said at that lecture that day, which I mean, she was quoting Corbusier that architecture begins with the plan. So instead of being hemmed in by the volumes that are represented in her investigative drawing, I thought we would explore them from the, from the plan, that is to look for space rather than to think of it as an object. So something about the dynamic of the composition of her drawing with the space above and the path climbing into it from below and the feeling of kind of journey through the volume. Um, I woke in my memory the beautiful topographical aspect of that famous shrine, roadside shrine of 
um, St. Bridget's Well outside Lascanor. And what's so beautiful in this place, um, touristical as it may have become, but what's so beautiful about it is that you can make a passage inside the body of the shrine or you can pass over it, you can clamber over it. And then when you do go inside, it's leading, it's a passageway leading to the to the well itself, to the holy well itself at the back, which is top lit from skylight. So there's a feeling of, of a hollowed out space. What what Rasmussen refers to as solids and cavities in his experiencing architecture book. So I'm thinking about how to find a way of exploring the space as if it is hollowed out space, a kind of journey space. Now, we've for a long time been thinking about the amazing presence of tiny little Greek mountain chapels on the kind of lunar landscape of, of Greek island topography among the fields of these um, empty landscapes, you find these beautiful little, uh, almost like cast volume chapel spaces. And this was a big uh, motivation, inspiration for our installation at the last Venice Biennale when we made this little model as a study for what we were doing. And so when people came to the pavilion, if you cast your mind back now to the Bridget's Well and think what's going on in the back of an architect's mind. Maybe it's this feeling that you should be able to climb over, climb under, climb through, um, meet yourself coming back down through the entangled passageways of, of um, spatial experience that you get, you get elevated and you get, you get dug in and you get overlapping space. Um, and so one of the first thoughts about how to interpret this Saha sketch was to try to strongly um, emphasize the idea of undercroft and journey so that you could you could find your way in underneath this thing and see a mysterious stair that would lead you up towards the light without knowing exactly where it was, where you were going to end up. Um, I think in our house that we designed in, in Kalini for a, a private family client, um, because this site had such a strange condition of being in a hollow in the ground on one side in its center of its site, and then having a wide open view to the sea on the other side. We tried to design the house itself as a kind of labyrinthine or journey of discovery from entry through a nested um, ground-based front door lobby leading to a stairs leading up through a passageway that eventually opened out to the upper floor, which looked out to the sea, a feeling of weight leading to lightness. Um, and I guess when we started to think about the solids and cavities of our approach to the Zaha drawing, this, this house or the spatial kind of compression release of this house was also in the mind. So here you see the model for the exhibition in its early stages of development. And if you think about the geometry of that and the kind of um, constriction, direction, space controlling aspect of that, maybe that drives me back a little further to the installation we made in Venice that we called Vessel um, nearly 10 years ago now, where we wanted a feeling of passage or, or um, uh, threshold um, beginning to enter something and then being slowed down on entry and then finding choices, maybe even blind alleys, but a feeling of discovery and then and then delivery, um, which was the journey of the exhibition gore through our vessel, but was really a thought about how to bring weight and lightness, a kind of compression and release into the experience of of a of an architectural body. And I, I have to go on this little bit of a detour to talk about cast space, because I'm trying to talk about all the thoughts that were 
um, running in my head at the time that I was trying to redraw or, or uh, take on the conversation with the Zaha drawing. So what I think is so magic about this 300 year difference between when Alto is casting a glass vase out of a hollowed out um, tree trunk or when Borromini is carving out a kind of hollowed out um, bellied elliptical twisted elliptical shape for his uh, plan of San Carlo del Quattro Fontana that they're both Borromini and Alto are working with this idea of the limits of what, of the containment of what allows you to make a shape of a space, and then of the tendency to want to kind of carve out or clean out or or scoop out um, the embodiment of that space in solid space, as if space itself was a solid. And so I think what's so beautiful in this um, comparison between two people who don't who don't know about each other's work methods, um, to think about the commonality of the idea of subtraction or hollowing out or solid and cavity. Um, when I went to visit um, San Carlo, La Quattro Fontana, I'm amazed by the feeling of being able to step into and out of the main space. So here I am standing in one of the side pocket spaces, just peeping up into the main dome covered space. But there's a great feeling with the feet on the geometry of the floor, a great feeling of being in a side space uh, which belongs to a main space, but of being in both spaces at once. And I'm putting this picture of our building in Derry because I think the aspiration here was to hollow out a space from the middle of the block. As, as if the pressures were all to do with what can be generated inside the building. It was a very restricted site, um, but we're scooping out the space we can make and letting the light pour in from the top, treating, treating architecture as a matter of solidity and light. So I'm getting closer now to finishing where we got to with this design for um, the exhibition. But we went on one outing. We managed one outing this summer in the lockdown year, and that was to go back to Inishman, where we love to walk. And we saw this rock formation that we had never seen before, although we thought we knew Inishman very well. And this this rock formation suddenly seemed like a like a building block by itself. It looked um it looked like a, a two-story um, city block with a street lane at the back and an overhanging portico at the front and and a relationship, a kind of stepping relationship with the ground. And it was actually a great help in in trying to imagine the, the form of this of this thing that um, I was drawing. Um, so I'm trying to describe how I approached making this thing from the inside out and from the ground up and still give it its autonomy as a piece of work, but still give it its, its inherited uh, characteristics, which come from directly out of um, Zaha's drawings, and still make it feel like it's a part of the work that we've been trying to do, or a kind of language that we have been trying to um, develop in the experience of space in our own work. So in plan, imagine it's a house. I don't know if it's a house, but imagine it's a house and it's at the end of a terrace. So that's why it has one blank wall. And then there are ways into it from the street or from a garden or, or ways of crawling around inside the, the pocket spaces that make up the base of the house. And as you make your way in, maybe it's the ruin of a house. As you make your way in through its structure, you find the side courts and side spaces, and then you find the stair that leads you up, up into a two compartmented room, or maybe it's a single spatial loft that's kind of articulated in two compartments. Maybe there are views in two directions, like um, like the kind of in, enforced um, geological direction that you saw in those 
rocks in Inishman. So you could look out to a view in one direction or you could be drawn over to look towards an object in the in the other direction or some splinter of light could enter at the center of the plan. So I gave this to um, Hugh in our office and I asked him to think about how you could cast from these drawings and make, um, make a kind of spatial journey out of it. So we made some tests in the in the casting of the plaster, we made some adjustments to it to make it stand a bit better, make it um, make it more sturdy and make it more interesting volumetrically. And uh, here's you working outside the door of the of the closed down office to try to get this figure into some kind of convincing form. And he made this lovely set of drawings because you know. It had to go into the exhibition and we didn't know what had it to be shipped or it had to be sturdy for travel. So part of the fun of the game was thinking about it in its parts and its component of parts as if it's prefabricated in its construction and then how that gets packed into into its container. So I like these pictures that you took of how he packed the model. Um, you know, first the basement, then the loft, then eventually compressing it in and that reminded me of the origins of the of the whole design itself. So to conclude, I would say that um, for you to think about if you're looking at it in the exhibition is to just imagine the dark or, or shady spaces of the undercroft, the sheltered, um, step in out of the rain type spaces of the undercroft. And then to imagine the release or the arrival or the um, development up into the lighter and more outwardly oriented spaces of the loft. And then to imagine that apart from its boundary wall with this imagined continuous terrace and apart from its groundedness in this um, heavily worked groundworks, to imagine the whole thing floating in space. Not not like um, the outer space that, that the questioner in the National Gallery asked Zaha, but more about um, space in general. And so to close, um, thinking about these thickened walls and the feeling of journey, at the moment we, we are working very intensely on the development of a building on site for the VNA in London. And we're thinking about it as a kind of movement within the thickness of the wall that the museum is protected from the outer world by its by a solid cloak, a kind of cast cloak. And within the sleeves and um, linings of that cloak, the staircases and movement systems for the public to be within the museum, but in contact with the street. So that it's a it's a solid presence, but it, it has its openness or its invitational openness in its form. And I think that this uh, side project of trying to imagine um, how to deal with the inherited object of Zaha's drawing, it has stirred up some of these thoughts and it has um, allowed us to make this now, I think, small but autonomous piece of work that belongs to us now, but um, is motivated by the challenge of being asked to deal with a drawing made by another.